All right, everybody, we should be live. Um, welcome to the long forgotten and long awaited uh, weekly strength club podcast slash weekly shit posting. Um, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the bench press today. Um, I have Australia's strongest bench presser here with me, Mick Solomons. How are you doing? Uh, going well, mate. Going well. <clears throat> How was your last bench press workout? Oh, it was great. I actually identify as a woman now, so that's why I hold the Australian record for uh, bench pressing. <laughs> so. We made it 28 seconds into the podcast <laughs> before the off first off-color joke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go, going good, going good. Going good. All right. Um, uh, Chase Lindley, where, how's it going? Where are you, man? Looks like you're in some strange foreign land. Yeah, so I'm actually in a hotel right now. Our house is getting renovated. Um I guess gained so much body weight that I'm starting to put holes in our floor because my fat ass and I just stomp everywhere. Now nah, we just we had a shitty ass um, rental that we finally got a hold of some people and our property manager and be like, look, can y'all do some updates while I, y'all just put it up, put us up in a hotel room and you know, we're we're not there essentially. That's a lot of y'alls. I like yeah. that. Yeah, this is a very Texan deal. Was it a handshake oh. or was there a contract signed? Was it was it handshakes? Only? No, it was more so just like angry hands. emails. Uh, screaming <laughs> profanity into a phone to voicemails. And uh, did business. you go down to his office and you had to walk through the door sideways because no. you're too big? Oh, fuck you know, I wish, man. So th these people are, their headquarters are in Savannah, Georgia. So I'm like, fuck, man, I really want to mm -hmm. fly, but I don't want to wear a mask, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they're, I guess, kind of like another branch is in, I think, Richard, Texas or so. So it's, Richard. I just fucking left Texas. <laughs> I know, I should have just played a little bit and I would have <laughs> fucking yeah. dropped, picked some doors. Yeah, it's a real place. Um, but how was your last bench press workout, Chase? I'm going to be honest. I haven't benched in about two weeks, three that weeks. That was going to be my question. So you're you're prepping for the Olympic lifting meet. How long do you have until that guy? Uh, it's the 24th of this month. So I think, what, like two weeks from now? Okay. All right. Math is hard. We'll find yeah. out and get back to you on that one. Um, but, yeah, so bench frequency has definitely tapered off. How's the frequency mm -hmm. for either strict press or your press 2.0? Uh, my actual pressing, I've kind of dropped that down too. Um, I've been really practicing just the movement of the cleaner press. Uh, so today, for example, I did some three singles, relatively heavy, um, and just practice that. And then I'll do one more, actually, I think two more sessions on the, the cleaner press. So the frequency is roughly still high, um, but I'm doing, you know, more intensity on the, I think it's it's Thursday where I do a max clean and press just for a single and then um, Friday, I do all three lifts, kind of get myself prepped for just the the meat okay. tempo. And that was this guy. We have a we have some clean and jerks here. Yeah, so this is a clean and jerk, and uh, you'll see how shitty my jerk is. Yeah, I just felt like my front foot just got stuck, and I need to reach it out more. But for some reason, like I've been having this weird tendency here lately of like something in the back of my mind is just like, no, you just need to power it. I'm like, I've never really tried <laughs> power, but. For some reason, I'm still having like this little mental hiccup of like, look, I just need to set my feet. Okay, interesting. All right, do you think it's actually holding you back from anything right now? I mean, things are um, still going well enough. Why, why make the change? I, I, I'm not trying to make the change. I think it's just I just need a little bit more practice. Um, what I've been failed to doing, I think, here recently is that I haven't really been doing any jerks out, outside of the, the rack. Um, mainly, I'm getting all my jerk work from my cleans. Okay. All I think right. I need to practice it a little bit more. Um, yeah. So what, what I'll start doing now is as I'm warming up, I'll pay more attention to it, kind of work on more foot placement and stuff and just really hound it in, hopefully, in time for the meet. How, do you like block jerks? Do you do those guys often? Uh, we don't have blocks in the gym. It's all just from the rack. Okay. And it can be a big pain in the ass, but, um, I, I mean, it, the, the times that I've done it, um, I can't – again, I think it, there's something to do with just – the momentum from whenever you catch a clean, um, the oscillation kind of helps you too a little bit. Taking a jerk out of the rack is a lot harder than it's just a, such a dead weight with that. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it totally is such dead. a dead weight. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I like it. What are you planning on wearing to the meet? Are you going to do an old timey singlet? I wish. I, I will have a, a Nike singlet that I can probably like cut out to where I look like Anatoly Pizarinko. You know, we're like nipple showing, just like oh yeah. Shows. You got to do like old yeah. Italian. It basically looks like the Borat uh, swimsuit. Yeah. It's basically yeah. what those old man things look like. That should be really what the goal is here. All right. But we're going we're gonna to hop into the Why are you using the crash pads? What's going on there? Oh, that's oh, a good question. Okay. Funny story. So let's back up a few weeks. Um, we are sandwiched here in OKC between a juice bar, kind of like a, like a health nut, uh, you know, 
Herbalife tea thing. Okay. And then the other one is a nail salon, right? <laughs> so the, the people at the, um, the little shake place, the um, the owner, he actually trains with us in the morning and his son runs the shop. His son's a competitive uh, CrossFitter. So he's, he's used to the noise and just the banging around, right? The, the gym atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Well, on the other hand, the people in the nail salon aren't. Uh, so we get the, this one lady come in, uh, this was like, uh, I'd say a month or so ago. She comes in. Take, take that's where she's from. I mean, oh, well, I'm kind of getting there. So it's broken <laughs> English, right? It's broken English. Oh, and man. it's basically, you know, hey, turn down the noise. I'm like, oh, man, like the music <laughs> isn't the problem. You know, like at slowly kind of getting onto it. And I, I come to the conclusion, oh, she means my, my dropping of the weights. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, look, it's not the music, uh, it's me dropping the weights. And I, you know, I've kind of somewhat can control the eccentric, but on those max attempts, there's no way. Um, yeah, it's just a big pain in the ass. So, you know, I was like, I'll show you it, you know, I'll kind of demonstrate how we do it. She's like, no, 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 just turn down the noise. I'm like, all right, this is getting nowhere. Just I'll... Yeah, she doesn't want to see your clean and jerk, man. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. So I just you should have showed her, her like, black no way. she might have been impressed with that. Just take your shirt off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's like the old Asian lady that's not really that hot. So I'm like, no. Oh no, <laughs> this is tragic. Really so, uh, fast forward like another two weeks, and then I get the landlord coming in. He's like, "Hey, can I speak to the owner?" I'm like, "Oh, he just stepped out, um, but I, I can call him saying that you want to talk to him." He goes, "Well, this is what it is. I need you to stop with all the crashing." I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "You need to stop everyone in here from lifting." I go. What do you mean? It's a- and then, it, then again, it dawned on me. Oh, he means me, you know, dropping the weights because he was next door working on one of their fixtures or something like that. He kind of just like is a handyman and he works on all the, the rentals there. Um, so I told him, I was like, look, everyone here, they're fairly, you know, weak and they're not pushing anything that's going to cause that much uh, troubles with vibrations. Like they're all probably deadlifting 185 at the most and then various weights below 185. I told him we we specifically do this on platforms, right? So that the, the concrete isn't going to be damaged or anything like that. And that I take full responsibility of all the noise. Like it's me. Um, I'm back here on this large surface area of this platform, the Olympic platform. So where I can kind of walk around, I can manage stuff and it's not going to drop on the concrete. Because And he also brought that up, that he's really adamant about me breaking his four inch reinforced concrete. I'm like, no, it's yeah, not it's going to happen. Mm-mm. Yeah. And um, I told him that and he goes, what do you know? Like you're, you're a strength coach. You don't, this isn't, this is nothing to do with your job. I go, no, sir. Like it is part of my job because I get dumbasses like you coming in here thinking that they know more than I know about the subject. Did and I told him like, look, we're using, I hope you suplexed him. <laughs> no, I can't do that. I can't do that. So I, uh, you know, I told him we're using rubber. I'm, I'm controlling it. And he goes, no, like you need to stop right now. And the funniest thing was is that we finally got in deep into the conversation. He's like, look, you're being really defensive. You're being really admin. I'm like, no, sir. I'm, like, I'm talking to you normally, like just like how I'm talking to y'all. And he finally brought up the question. He's like, why do you have to be so strong? I'm like, <laughs> it's part of my job. Stay he's small, like, why man. Can't, why can't you go train somewhere else? I'm, like, I'm not going to go train somewhere else. And I'm not going to quit. And he's like, I'll talk to your, your owner and stuff like that. And then we finally were just like, all right, even though this guy is a big pain in our ass, we kind of need this location. And it's yeah. funny, like in the in the the lease agreement, like it clearly states that we are going to you know make some noise, drop some weight. But um, my boss is actually a, a civil engineer, so where he actually did the math and showed like I would have to drop basically like a thousand pounds overhead at such a higher velocity to even make somewhat of a crack in it. Mm-hmm. So now, and now, again, now I've got a goal. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Now the guy's just you know kind of an asshole, but ever since we got those crash pads, it, it was a little bit of a pain in the ass to kind of get used to them, but they're fine now. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. Okay, cool. We got a few people in the chat. We got Jim Pack. We got Kojo uh, Idrissa. That's cool. So name. Kojo, he's actually uh, was one of our members down in starting from Houston. Oh, nice. Okay. Hey, Kojo. We got T-Door, kind of iron, cool dude. Um, but okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll get in the meat of this episode. Um, this is the bench press episode. We're going to go over a bunch of all things bench press. We'll kind of do the typical routine we have been doing. Um, we're just going to be going through the starting strength video to kind of see why they're teaching it the way that they teach it. Um, but first of all, uh, let's do some shilling. We have Chase Lindley at Chase Lindley. Um, and then the cooler Chase, Chase underscore Lindley. 
I still transpose which one is which. Chase is the underscore. Or Chase, are you the not underscore one? No, I'm the not underscore. You're the not underscore one. But 2.0 next to the, the new Chase. I know, but I was thinking that the other Chase Lindley was the original one. I did this a while ago, and I tricked myself with my own joking. It's not no, very good luck. This, mine's the plain Jane Chase Lindley. Plain Jane Chase Lindley. Um, Chase that does online new, coaching. That should be your new Instagram name. Plain Jane. Plain Jane plain Chase Jane. Lindley. Plain Jane Chase. Um, Chase does online coaching. He's a smart guy. He also does in-person coaching. You can find him at this Instagram and then DM him various things. Slide into his DMs. Um, uh, there's my website. I avoid social media like the plague. I'm fairly busy already, so I don't think I need to uh, spend too much time uh, looking at pictures of uh, cat memes. Um, is that what Instagram is nowadays? What is it? Most of, what's most of your feed, Chase? Is it mainly it's lewd women like, or is it lifting weights? It's, it's propaganda, right? <laughs> People talking about COVID and how COVID's going to basically make your insides turn to liquid and you're going to be shitting yourself to death. Um, yeah, but like the people I follow, like I try to stay out of politics too much, like because both sides, I feel like have just gotten out of control. Um, it's mainly just basically all starting strength, right? What's happening in the gym in Boise, what's happening in the gym in you know uh, Austin. The world starting of starting to- strength. Basically, so there yeah, is like, a way. There is a way. Yeah, and then like a few people that I follow, like I like watching Dan Green every now and then because Dan Green's fucking ridiculously strong. Um, he's kind of making like a comeback with his deadlifts and stuff. Um, then I follow like some way to think pages and stuff. That's about okay, it. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so there is, there's a healthy way to do Instagram. Chase has figured it out apparently. Um, but yeah, I do online coaching as well. Um, if you'd like a smarter eye what you have with programming, uh, let me know. If you would like to talk to Mick or if you'd like to get videos onto this show, email support at strength.club. Um, so if you do want to talk to Mick, send in a video of yourself lifting and then include maybe a, Hey, how's your day going? Something like that. He'll probably respond. I love that stuff. Love yeah. That. <laughs> That's why he wakes up in the morning. Um, <laughs> but here are the topics that we're going to go over after we talk through the video and we're going to cover the grip, the compression grip, what amount of wrist extension we're allowed to be in, um, the grip with itself, where we want our forearms to be at the bottom, um, the bar path. Are we thinking about it like a straight line going back over the shoulder or are we thinking about it kind of like a J? Um, that'll be an interesting topic. Um, the arch, what we're doing with our torso during the bench press itself, how we pack our shoulders, um, when to incorporate leg drive, and that kind of touches into the gaze. Um, and then we're going to finish off uh, with programming considerations, um, which you guys can see here. Um, but we'll start this by going through these checks. and some form checks. That's yeah, very got true. Some, got some bench press form checks from the uh, from the app. We do. Um, we got a bunch of people benching like forty five pounds. It's pretty kick ass. All right, so starting strength, learning the bench. We got Bree here doing her thing. She's benching a pretty casual 95. Block. <clears throat> okay. Wooden block. How do you like those benches, Chase? Man, they're pretty solid. Um, they're kind of, they cut out all the bullshit to where if you're not in the proper configuration, I and mean, we'll kind of talk about this later, but if your shoulders aren't properly squeezed together, you're not getting a good arch, like you're going to feel it. Um, but like as far as you sliding around or stuff, um, you know, we, we've had people sometimes use bands, right? Kind of that band trick where you loop them around and kind mm-hmm. of have a little bit of friction, chalk on the shirt. But I always find like either chalk or just whenever I get sweaty naturally, I always kind of like lock into the bench. Yeah, good. All right, so first point of consideration here is in relationship to the unwrap. Um, What he went over in this point is that your eyes should be on the same side of the bar as your feet. Um, What happens is that most of the time people will get a little bit too far north and the bar will be like bisecting their face. So it'll be like right over their mouth, for example. And then what will happen is as they're trying to unrack the bar, it will already be below their shoulder, right? So then they'll end up benching a little bit too low the entire time because they unracked it low. Mm. Um, Yeah. So he's going over that now, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the grip width. So they started at the intersection between the smooth and the neural, and you move your hands out generally about one thumb distance. That's pretty standard for most folks. Yeah, usually like how I like to do it is, you know, you take your press grip because essentially whenever we do the intro, um, I I like to teach people the squat, the press, and the deadlift because benching is it's fairly natural. Like everyone kind of has some sort of an idea of bench in their brain. It's kind of like in our DNA now. Um, so where you say like, hey, take your press grip and let's go one hand width wider than that. That usually, yeah, it's about a thumb length. Mm-hmm. Um, and then depending on anthropometry, you may need to go a little bit wider and stuff. But our, 
a general guideline that we're looking for on the, the bench here, the grip, is to see if the forms are vertical as we're touching the chest. And if it's not, uh, we need to bring it in or out to where the forearms right there in that configuration you can see on Bree, uh, they're vertical. Okay, so we're at the top of the rep. We're gonna go down to the bottom. Okay, right there. So it looks like our forearms are tucked in just a little bit. That's actually okay. Um, it's never gonna be truly vertical because if where we're looking at in terms of the weight being routed through our forearm, it's kind of coming in through the interior of the palm, not the widest point of the hand. So if we're going by the edge of the hand, then it will be like a little bit more tilted in. Um, but with where it is, it's gonna be always coming in just a tad. Um, you'll see a lot of power lifters, for example, who are trying to shorten the range of motion and they'll widen their grip up. We'll talk about that more later. Um, but for general recommendations, we want them more or less perpendicular to the ground at the bottom. And then start and add some weight. Uh, first day expectations for bench press, Chase. When you get most people coming to the gym, what are they benching? Mm, like guys, I'm gonna say around like 85 pounds for, for chicks. Uh, usually about the bar, right? Because again, like mm -hmm. what I was saying earlier, is that everyone, the bench has been so popularized here in the past few decades that everyone's associated something to do with working out with, I need to be benching, right? Yeah. Uh, the press, on the other hand, no one really knows how to do it. Um, the timing is all weird, so people really don't know that. Um, whereas just laying down, touching the chest, and coming back up is fairly simple. Mm -hmm. um, so we can touch on two good things here. Um with this specific freeze frame, the touch point, right? Cause we kind of have these landmarks here. Um, we have uh, basically this, this horizontal line from starting strength and kind of where the underwire for her bra would be. And then this will also give us a good clue about wrist position, right? Cause we always say we want pretty neutral wrists. But whenever you look at an actual bench, the hand is gonna be tilted back like this. This kind of 15 degree, 15 to 20 degree tilt backwards is really what we're looking for. If someone's wrist is like truly neutral, I'll make myself the big, uh, screen right here. Um, if someone's wrist is really like this, okay, the bar is going to fall out of their hand because it will almost entirely be in their thumb, right? So when we say neutral wrist, it's going to be falling to about this position right here. And then whenever we go back to having Brie on the big screen here, you'll be able to see that same exact thing. Um, so the grip position that we're looking for is, is this more or less uh, what we still call neutral. Um, and then for the touch point, um, it's not super high. It's not super low. Um, for girls, I always like to use like the underwire of their bra kind of is it's a good starting landmark A lot of times we'll have to move it up um, for guys. I'll normally say just right under your nipple line um, Chase what landmarks do you go for touch point? Yeah um, Nipples for kids because usually telling them anything other than you know really discreet landmarks They don't know what the fuck they're they're talking about <laughs> or you know I usually touch their sternum I say you know touch your sternum just above mm -hmm. your sternum uh, generally like a uh, bra strap. Did you try that one? No, no. <laughs> um, but it's, it's kind of a zone, right? It, it's going to depend on people again. Um, so like that zone of just above the sternum, like the sternum is usually about the end of the zone. And then I think about the nipples is the other end of it. And that little range is about like an inch of a range, maybe half an inch depending mm -hmm. on people. Usually that's where I'm kind of gauging, um, uh, the touch point on. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. It's, it's going to be a range and you'll have to dial it in. I think that most of the time the touch point is going to depend on how long their arms are. Um, if yeah. someone has really long upper arms, that touch point is going to be pretty modulated. Um, they went over here um, in relationship to uh, basically what she's doing with setting up with her arch, right? So you're going to see these screenshots of her wiggling. Um, and then right now we'll see it too um, with her pulling her shoulder blades back and behind her. Um, this is the scapular retraction that we'll go over a little bit later. This is called packing your shoulders. Um, what she's trying to do is to use her back muscles to pull her shoulders all the way behind her while using her chest to shove all the way out in front of her. Um, it's going to make your arms feel really short, right? So you almost want to think about it like making the entire uh, motion for the bench press a really short stroke. It shouldn't feel like an overly long movement where you're reaching your shoulder forward and then pulling your shoulder back. Um, yeah, B's, uh, Bree's set up super well for this bench here. Um, I wonder what her bench press is. I don't follow her training, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's really strong. I think I saw her press 135, so I'm sure her bench is flying. Yeah, I bet she's like almost getting close to the 200. That's, that's super impressive. exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Um, for yeah, and for most men too, honestly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to see this one more time. Um, so, do you get a lot of people in the gym who really can't uh, move their shoulders backwards, kind of that freely, like she was doing? Mm, to some extent, everyone can usually do it. 
Okay. Um, but if not, like, uh, you know, this sequence here, usually I'll kind of cue and we'll kind of talk about this more whenever we go over shoulder packing. But um, not only is it together, but I want to see how her chest kind of rotates up. I'll kind of yep. cue them to, you know, rotate the shoulder blades underneath them more. And that kind of helps a lot of a lot of the time the shoulder blades not slipping out and um, then getting a nice arch in the back. Yeah, this is whenever I like to, like you were talking about with rotating the shoulders, this is when I like to start talking about pulling the shoulders down to the waist. Mm -hmm. um, it's, always a, it's always a good time to understand that at first. Uh, we got a few comments um, here while this video is continuing to play. Um, Greg Locke, uh, I'm on vacation. My training schedule has been variable. Is it bad if I work out at 9 a.m. one day and 9 p.m. the other day? Honestly, no. Um, it, if you're working out uh, on back-to-back -back days, <laughs> Um, the muscle group should be sufficiently different where it really doesn't matter. You know, um, I've done a lot of like 9 p.m. So let's say you can train out that night and then the following morning, then it gets a little bit close because you only have like 10 hours or so between your workouts, but it's fine. Um, Steven Louie said, uh, thoughts on wrist wraps. Um, I think they're great. I don't yeah. have any problems with them. Um, it depends on kind of like why you're using them if you have a complete inability to control your wrist position in space and you've decided just to, you know, uh, use those before figuring that out. It's a little bit iffy, um, but for most people, that's not. Uh, that's not that bad. Um, and Crown of Iron said, Rip's comments on RPE have triggered almost as many YouTubers as his views on the trap bar. I have not been keeping tabs on that Crown of Iron, honestly. So I remember seeing one video on that. Chase, have you been watching those, Mick? Well, I mean, I kind of uh, watch them every now and then, but um, I mean, I agree with Rip's standpoint on RPE. Like I've been training well over a decade now and I haven't used RPE. Now, granted, I've been growing and kind of following the same program for the majority of those years, but I think that, you know, the vast majority of people who are training don't need RPE. Like the people who need RPE are uh, severely, severely master athletes or, um, you know, really advanced athletes, almost elite level in the sense that like you're an Olympian, uh, you're going into your next cycle for the Olympics, you know, you have four years to do it. So we kind of have to gauge, you know, what RPE that we're kind of hitting. Uh, during those times kind of leading up to the event. I'll have a little bit more of a generous take. If you're someone who has very fluctuating acute performance for whatever reason, so like if you have PT in the morning, if you're a lot of military guys, if you have military shit going on in the morning, if you have sport practices that you can't really control the intensity of, right? So I'll have some guys who'll have a, let's say they love Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday practices. Sometimes those are three easy practices in a row. Sometimes they're hard as shit, right? You have no idea. Um, because at a really structured level of athletics, like the ones Chase is talking about, they'll be able to coordinate those things. Um, but at the casual level of athletics that a lot of people partake in, you know, um, they will not be able to coordinate those two events. You know, so the coach who they're going to for their Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday practices doesn't give a shit about your lifting. Um, things like that are PE helpful for the vast majority of people. I don't think you'll you'll really need it. Uh, Arco Kapaz, I've noticed I'm stronger with a close grip on the bench press. I have somewhat short arms. Interesting. Yeah, what, <clears throat> what does that mean, though? How how narrow actually is it? Uh -huh. Arco, send us a video. We'll find out. We'll pop this guy back up there. Here we on. go. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll rip into some topics then. Um, all right, and then we'll go here. Man, technology. I love it. All right, cool. Um, any any leftover comments on those videos, guys? Um, we really didn't talk about, I guess, kind of the bar path or yeah, that's a big one for later. Yeah, um, uh -huh. which we'll kind of get into the, like the next slide and stuff. But um, I like to point out leg drive. Um, I like to do it as soon as possible. Now, in the teaching progression, right? I, I let everyone kind of get familiar with the grip, eye positioning, touch, all that stuff, and then I dive deep into the leg drive once we have weight. Um, the important part of the leg drive is that we have to reinforce the arch, right? Mm -hmm. So you have one end being the shoulder blades underneath the bar, um, at the start of the rep. And then the other end of the arch essentially is your butt, right? Now, as you get some weight on there, you'll see a lot of this time as like, you know, in the global gyms or just people as you're training, um, they'll start kind of like dancing around and then they'll cave. Essentially they'll kind of go into like almost a flat bench and they'll, they'll get stuck down there. Right. Um, so I, I teach people to not only drive their legs on the way up when the bar is coming up to rack it, but on the way down too to help reinforce that touch. Because a lot of times they'll people will bounce it. Um, the touch point kind of gets all jambled up with them kind of just not being prepared at the bottom. 
mm -hmm. um, the loosening up, all that stuff. We have a really good video that'll cover that one. Um, someone in the uh, who submitted a form check, um, they were so soft at their legs coming on down in the bottom. Whenever the bar hit their chest, they would slide their whole body down. So like when the bar hits them, the whole thing will shift down to the bottom and then they'll kick it back up. You'll see that pretty frequently. Um, hey, um, just quickly, so there's a guy, Arco Kapaz, in the chat. If you send me a video right now of your bench press, we will form check it later on. So oh, support, nice. support at strength.club. Send it through if you've got it, um, and we'll chuck it on later on. So send it later. through. He says he has a weak upper chest. From playing tennis, I developed the side and lower chest just looking at it. Man, interesting. That Set would be crazy up. if you just had this big shelf of just just yeah, this yeah, hard, yeah, rigid yeah, shelf. My, yeah, my right arm's much bigger because of tennis. Tennis <laughs> from tactical tennis playing. Um, but okay, yeah, we'll take this top from bottom here. Um, we'll start with the grip. Um, so Chase, I know you said you like to teach the press before the bench. Um, are there any nuances that you have to cover in the grip for people that separate the two? Are they pretty similar where you can just kind of go straight in? Uh, they're fairly similar. Like um, I kind of make that another that correlation that's similar to the press is um, just make a diamond with your hand, right? And that kind of orients mm -hmm. the bone to the form, one underneath the load, and uh, kind of gets our, our wrist better into the proper position, right? And, and you were kind of pointing this out earlier. There is going to be some slight wrist extension. Um, if someone is kind of pointing that out and they are like overdoing it, I say, look, just take the grip, really make a tight fist, squeeze as hard as you can. That's about as much wrist extension that you're going to need throughout the whole entire movement. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Squeezing the bar can be a really good cue for maintaining wrist extension or as much as we need. Um, the, I, the biggest thing that I've noticed is that honestly, the the bench press, I like people to get into a good bit of our internal rotation with their hands. So getting here, it honestly will require a little bit more I've found than the press will because the press, it's a little bit lighter. And since it's, you know, just where it's carrying, it can be held kind of more closely to the thumb for most people. And whereas the bench with how heavy the thing is, it's going to be, you're going to have to turn your hand down a good bit. Um, so yeah, there's, there's not terribly many differences. If you have a good press grip, you'll have a good bench grip, um, really without too much fuss there. Um, the next point, uh, the grip width. Um, so determining the grip width and then kind of workshopping how to find that. Um, I'll always tell people like, you know, video your second, your third warm up set. If it's still being really inconsistent for yourself, um, don't do it at 45 pounds and then just attempt to remember, remember it. Um, but you know, let yourself kind of warm up try to figure it out on your own and then visually check in afterwards. Pause at the bottom of the rep, keep your elbows in a good place. If your forearms are vertical at the bottom, that's a pretty good indicator things are on the right track. Um, your forearms could not be vertical at the bottom because you are pulling your elbows in a little bit too much or you're flaring them out a little bit too much. Um, but those are some separate issues that kind of relate to uh, like elbow tucking. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that, Chase. Um, what do you tell people to do with their elbows when they're doing the bench? I just pull them towards the feet, and that usually gets them into a line. Um, you said pull the, them towards their feet during the descent? Point them. Just point, point them. them. Okay. Now, you know, I, I kind of go over a little bit if they're still having hard, um, a hard time kind of con configuring out or, or rather pointing out where their elbows need to be. Mm -hmm. um, they've got shoulder extension or uh, shoulder retraction, or scapular retraction. I can't even talk to them. They got all that stuff figured out, right? So it's not that their shoulders are loosening or, or getting off the bench. It's just they don't know how to stop from chicken wing, right? Mm -hmm. so I'll get them just to point it a little bit towards the feet. Um, or like, you know, I'll, I'll sit them up and be like, do you remember whenever you were doing pushups back in the day? And it's about, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's about right here, right? Yeah. And that usually gets people into the right configuration, right? Like that 70 degrees of um, adduction is what we're kind of shooting for in my head. Now, you can't really tell people 70 degrees because they don't know where the fuck that is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, or I'll, I'll physically just move their hand into the proper position and be like, look, do you feel how that's a little bit more stable? Um, you're able to actually keep tight in this configuration. You're not loosening. You're not feeling any pain from impingement. And they go, yeah, 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 I feel that. This is a big tactile cue moment. Even if someone, if, like, if I know we have their grip in the right position, I'll tell them to pause at the bottom and I will physically walk and I will put their elbows in the correct spot. Mm -hmm. Then I'll tell them, get tight to it, squeeze, and then, you know, continue on with their bench pressing. Um, yeah, so the, the grip width and the elbow tucking, that's a, that's a big manual uh, or tactile cue one for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the bar... Cool. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, how do you stop? I think you guys talked about it before, but how do you stop? I always have this issue where my right scapula always just, I don't know what you call it, just kind of pops out. Pops out. Yeah. Same. just I've always had this issue. And I think when I went to the seminar years ago, Brent kind of 
like he he told me like that's the issue you've got and he he worked it out how to fix it but i just it just always just pops out every single time interesting chase what's your take on that um may just be how you're setting up you may be favoriting one side of the bench if you're not uh and it's kind of hard to figure out by yourself you, you may need to videotape it to get someone who's I mean, you don't have to have a coach kind of figure this one out. Just a, a normal gym bro can hopefully be like, yeah, you're a little bit off center or so, right? Yeah. Um, if you're not and you're doing everything perfectly, you're lining up on the bench, um, you know, it, it may just be how you're squeezing, right? So you can't just hold this, the shoulder blades together, right? Because as the weight is pushing you down, it's wanting to flatten out and spread out the shoulder blades, right? So you're going to actually have to maintain the arch. And I think we'll kind of talk about it on this next little bullet point right here but it, it's the shoulder blades are not only together but they're also kind of tucked down underneath oh, okay. um so that way that the shoulder joint is more underneath the bar and um it's not going to get flattened out once you touch mm -hmm. i think it, it seems like it tends to happen um when i unrack the bar that's what i've noticed yeah you're just you're you're losing that contraction so uh, and, and this is the angle again you may have to scoot up to where your shoulders are more underneath the bar um, so you can actually unrack it by yourself without losing your shoulder positioning. The self unrack of heavyweights is a tricky one for sure. It is. It's a lot yeah. of practice. You have to get really good at like picking your hips up. You'll see a lot of very heavy powerlifters. They'll honestly, they'll have their feet on the bench. It'll be like this giant decline bench to pull the thing out and then they'll get their feet down. Um, what I've noticed with people who have one shoulder popping out is that, you know, let's say if they're sitting up on the bench, they'll go left shoulder back, right shoulder back. And then the right shoulder is the, always the one that pops out first. The second shoulder they pack, it's never as tight as the first one. Um, so if they're going left shoulder back, they'll scoot themselves over on the bench because they only did one shoulder at a time. Um, I always like to tell people to do a little bridge with your head, push your head back into the bench to lock yourself in, and then you can set both at the same time. Um, normally I found it's an order thing. Honestly, like the second shoulder that gets packed is the one that pops out. Um, or just do more back work. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have a stronger, meatier back, unfortunately. <laughs> A lot of band work. Is that what you're suggesting? Get some bands. You do too much band work. You're in music school right now. I'm saying about <laughs> lifting weights, man. <laughs> lifting weights, not band work. Um, I've got but, a funny story for you after the stream anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll remember that one. Um, but yeah, so so the arch and shoulder packing. Um, yeah, so that's something that it's it's people think it's going to be a just one day. They're just going to magically do it and it's going to click. It's not. It's the same thing as the squat grip. Um, there's a, you have to neurologically gain the ability to squeeze yourself into that position. It's just like back extension. It's just like thoracic extension on like the press or anything else like that. It takes time to learn and time to be able to squeeze yourself into that position. Um, so, you know, don't prevent yourself from uh, like benching very early on in the career. Cause you're like, oh man, I can't nail down the shoulder position. So I'm gonna stay at 155 or I'm gonna stay at 185 keep benching and as you get stronger you'll develop a better ability to pack your shoulders behind you um i didn't really feel like i could pack my shoulders well probably until like the first like two years of benching i feel like yeah you know and there's kind of a critical threshold for muscle mass i've noticed as well not like in a jokey way with what we were saying with mick um but like when you have more muscle back there things make more sense with where to squeeze them to you know and that's yeah. that's very similar to the uh to the squat um Leg drive, uh, Chase, do you teach like an active leg drive, like a heave off the chest or what? No. So I, I still want just a, a light touch off the, the chest. Um, but in the standpoint of basically what I, I kind of draw it out in the sense that like your your back is an arch, right? And I kind of draw like a little illustration of a, a bridge. So you have one point of a force wanting to mash down one end and it's going to flatten the other right? Because the force is acting down here and it's translating down there. Now we have to now corral this by driving the feet, right? And getting the ass into position to where there's a nice little touch or rather arch. And on the touch, the arch is remaining um, nice and strong. Yeah. This, so this is Stig's Road, our, our sailor man Stig's Road in his national uh, uniform t-shirt. And a new gym location. And a new gym location. Who knows, man? <laughs> Who knows? Um, it seems like we have like 190, 195 on the bar right now. Um, this seems to be a really good example of a bench. The first few reps, he really wasn't using too much leg drive, and it actually slowed down the rest of the set. Um, this is kind of a point that I think a lot of people miss is that, like, oh, I won't have to use leg drive until the fourth or fifth rep of my set. 
You may not have to, but it will be faster if you use it the entire time, and you'll be able to produce more force that way. So it's like his first few reps here, he's pitter-pattering around with his feet. So like if you pay attention to his giant pink shoes, you'll see them kind of floating off the ground a few times. Um, and then once the reps get hard, he starts using his leg drive. Um, the leg drive that Chase was talking about, you want that the entire time. It's kind of that big push and that big support. Um, how do you feel about this bench, Chase? I like it. And then, yeah, as you can see on those first few reps, He's shifting around, he's moving around. So then it's causing more issues in the sense that now what if his shoulder blades pop off the bench, right? Mm -hmm. You have one end that you've already set up, right? And that's you getting and packing your shoulder blades underneath you. Now you have to set the other end and drive the feet continuously. Yep. Yeah, I think these are pretty good things. We're interested to see what benching programming is like. I always wonder that about these people who we see so frequently. I'm like, what the hell are they doing? These weight selections just seem all over the place. <laughs> Alex, got a question. What do you feel is your take on people wearing belts on a bench? Um, that's a good question. I think a lot of people are just really lazy and they just keep the damn thing on. <laughs> I agree. I, I think, personally, oh, I not think, this one. Here we go. Uh, Let's belt, try this one. A belt really doesn't do shit on the bench. Now, if you're benching, you know, 700 something pounds or 600 pounds and you're wearing a belt, Hey man, more power to you. I'll disagree on that one. I think the belt is really good for people to learn how to use their lats if you have lats, right? Because you can physically feel your lats pulling into the belt, right? So like if you're in a high arch and you kind of get that belt in the correct spot, you'll be able to feel your lats bite into the belt. Um, mm -hmm. That was really helpful for me kind of learning, you know, to pull my shoulders down into it. Um, but it's just like, it's it's not. I, I you know I think I've noticed for a lot of people like if they have like a lower back to we could be like yeah I mean keep your keep your belt on if you want to but it's it's not super critical. Um, yeah I don't, I don't I don't think so. Um, but this is the guy who I was talking about with his knee position. So what we're gonna see here is that this guy he's really loose on the descent and his feet are really far back. And if you look at his knees as the bar contacts them they're gonna shoot forward right they're gonna shoot forward and then rock back. Um, so what I would recommend for this guy is to move his feet out so he could get a more constant leg drive going backwards and he'll probably have a little bit of a better time as opposed to just kind of slamming the bar into his chest. Any other thoughts on this guy, Chase? Uh, that's right. You have a, if you get all of your feet down, you have a larger surface area to push from instead of your toes. Um, they can't adequately push hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're like a crazy flexible person, I'd be interested to see how big of an arch you can get into Chase with your... <laughs> your ability to extend your spine. Um, mm -hmm. But like if you're if you're attempting to just shorten the range of motion as much as possible by bridging really hard, you can tuck your feet back there, but otherwise it's not it's not super necessary, I don't think. Um, but yeah, so this guy, he's hitting- your power lifter. Yeah, 230 for a triple, so not terrible. Um, he's a pretty big guy. Um, but yeah, I would move the feet out, work on a more constant leg drive for this. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll head back to here. Now we can have, we saw a few benches. We can talk a little bit about uh, bar path. Um, bar path, how do you teach it, Chase? Um, usually I point out the touch point, right? And then someone will kind of figure out, or the vast majority of people will figure out, well, hold on, you've been telling me to go straight down or straight up on every other lift except for this one. Why is that? And the reason why is that impingement, right? If you were to go straight down, how we normally would, right, where the bar is over your shoulder to begin with, right? And we were to bring it down right over the, the joint, right? Kind of like if this guy were to align the bar instead of the touch point on his chest, right over where the uh, the glenoid cavity is or the head of the humerus, he's going to impinge a lot of shit. Um, that's where you hear people, you know, I uh, fucked up my shoulder back in the day on the bench and stuff like that. It's because either one, they've, they've lost that positioning of their shoulder blades on the bench and they let their elbows flare out, or they're trying to guillotine themselves with the touch point. <laughs> Right. So yeah. it, it, the touch point needs to be a little bit lower. Right. And that's to save us from impingement. Now there's kind of a flip side to this. There's a Moen arm, right? And you can kind of see all these weird lines at the top. So if I get this a lot too with kids is that, okay, you point that out and you say, Hey, look, this is bad. If you go neck up towards the neck, uh, we need you here. This is safe. And then they go right from the touch point to straight up from there. And then their arm is at an angle because they yeah. didn't close the Moen arm. Um, that's fine if you can handle that with like an empty bar, but as the weight gets heavier, you're not going to be able to complete the rep. So we're yeah. going to have this diagonal line that you can kind of see here, um, to where we, as we touch and go back to the lockout, we are shortening that moment arm and we're just getting it back to the shoulder. 
Yeah, so the the kind of the the um, impingement based uh, bench, which a lot of people have that oh, bench is dangerous for your shoulders idea that came up. It's very similar to the old timey thing where people are like saying oh, squats are bad for your knees, bench is bad for your shoulders, whatever. Um, those people will bench in a T pose, like literally, it'll be like out here, yeah. right? If you try to do it, it is incredibly inorganic. Um, it really feels awkward. Awkward is all hell, even if you've never benched before. Um, you know, so people tend to produce a little bit more force in this position. Everything seems to be more comfortable. Just go with it. Um, but what it does present, it presents a problem, right? Is because everything else we've been keeping the bar right over the middle of the foot, but our analog for the middle of the foot, which is the shoulder now, doesn't really seem to have that possibility. We, we are not able to keep the bar over the middle of our foot. So how do we deal with it? Um, we deal with it by having a not straight bar path. Um, so in reality, uh, it's never going to be perfectly straight. If it's perfectly straight, it's a really lightweight. More often than not, it's going to look like a little bit of a J. So it's going to come off the chest for an inch or two or so. Then it's going to swing back over the shoulder, and then it's going to continue going back up. Um, it kind of gets you past that little danger zone um, or whatever you want to call it, whenever it's, we're in that T pose. Um, and then the pecs will be back in the game, and you can finish the bench. Um, if you look at some really competent heavy bench pressers, um, they kind of solve the problem in two ways. Their rib cage is so massively large that they don't have to alter the bar path. Like if you look at Julius Maddox bench, it's a really straight bar path because his rib cage is wider than I think all three of ours combined. You know, um, he's like it literally. Yes. Yeah. Like if you look at him sitting on like a normal human piece of furniture, it looks comical. Right. Um, but, you know, they can solve that problem in that way by having a massive rib cage. Or what they do is they have that really kind of swooping back bar path where it comes off the chest, then it rockets back over the shoulders, and then they can finish it back up. Um, yeah, those are kind of the two methods for dealing with this problem. Um, but you can teach it as a straight bar path, but it's just now instead of straight up in the air, it's just tilted back. Um, that problem that Chase was talking about where people um, will leave the bar hanging, I'll call it south of the shoulder. They'll leave it hanging down here. Um, it's a really prevalent problem. People won't realize that it's a thing. They can bench 225 like that, and then they'll get stuck at 225 for four months, and they have will have no idea why. And they really they need to bring the bar all the way back up there. Um, you have to relearn some joint angles. It's kind of a big pain in the ass. Um, so just make sure that you're finishing it, or finishing every single rep with the bar right over your shoulders. It should feel really balanced. Um, so that covers the. Question. Oh, go for question it. In the chat. Yeah, Dallin Reynolds. Any opinions or knowledge on the reverse grip bench? been having bicep tendonitis and trying to reduce flare-ups. Hmm. Um, bicep tendonitis, just... as with like the, the distal insertion of your bicep, and you don't mean like forearm tendonitis down here, like golfer's elbow or tennis elbow? That's what I'm interested about. Um, the, the reverse grip bench, the supinated grip bench, um, very similar levels of pec recruitment, a little bit more uh, uh, pec minor up at the top because of the way that you can orient your humerus in the game. Um, it is honestly more stressful on your bicep because if you at any point let the, if you at any point open your elbow angle up too much, it becomes a huge bicep lift. So you have to be really good at controlling your forearm on the way down. That way your bicep isn't really that involved. Um, that would be risky, I would say, to go reverse grip bench for bicep tendonitis. Isn't it just generally risky because you're more likely to drop the bar on your face? Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, so I, I forgot there was a guy in the '90s who did this, and I think he benched like, uh, like six or seven yeah. wall, and like, and you know, he he did it with a reverse grip, and there's been some very successful people who've done that too. But you know, the problem with it is, is that those guys have figured out what's going on with all the movement patterns associated with now changing, you know, the the hands essentially from being you know pronated to supinated. Um, they're okay with the wrist being really more bent now because, again, you have that risk of now it's just your thumb supporting the bar with the supine grip. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you're going to let it bounce off your chest. It's a lot of wrist extension. Yeah. Yeah. And they, again, like what Alex brought up was a good point. It's just like they've, they've controlled it essentially to where they're, they're kind of tucking their shoulder blades in and letting them flare up a little bit, almost like they're shrugging so that they can save their bicep a little bit. Um, I don't think that's really a, a great idea in the sense that you're not really solid on the bench, but if someone can really get a crazy arch, you know, I can see that it can kind of help. Mm -hmm. But um, Dallin said uh, he's had spots in both. So he's, uh, he's had distal bicep tendon as well as uh, forearm. Um, I would check other places than your bench. It may be the most irritating on your bench, but it's probably 
it's almost always programming related, of course, um, or could be, you know, squat grip related. Check those more commonly found sources first, you know. Um, I wouldn't go to the reverse grip bench as the first solution. If you have access to dumbbells, a dumbbell bench or a football bar bench, like a Swiss bar, would probably solve those problems while being a little bit safer for you. So you can have a different wrist angle and have it not piss off your elbow so much. Um, yeah, or even a close grip. Yeah, close grip may work too. A pin bench, honestly, as well. Yeah, yeah. Re reach out to one of us, Dallin. Yeah, check out the chin up protocol as well that Starting Strength recommends. That works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, the gaze. Where are we looking during the bench rest, boys? Mick, let's see. Where do you know? Where, <laughs> yeah, where is it? quiz for Mick. Well, I have a little spot on my uh, roof that I look at where there's a dead moth. And it's oh. just been there. So oh, nice. um, yeah, so that's the moth is my spot. Nice. All right. So if you are bench pressing, find a dead moth, look at it. Um, but yeah, so I always like to have facilitate the, the point of the gaze so that the chin is still tucked up, uh, pointed up a little bit, right? I try to make sure that their face is tilted up and back. I feel like it facilitates the bar path going backwards more. Um, the easiest way to find out where a good gaze is, is that whenever you unrack the bar and it's over your shoulder, so not down here, but it's over your shoulder, the bar will be attached to the ceiling. Look at that exact spot. Don't forget it. And then when you come down, bring it back up to that same spot. It's super consistent. Yep. So just pretend mm -hmm. you're basically a really bored housewife who's having sex. And just oh, it God. As quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and just look at the roof. <laughs> yeah. Stare at the ceiling. Wait for it to be over. That's the enthusiasm yeah. we like that's in our exercise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's getting jacked over here. Um, Chase, anything different to add on the gaze there? No. Nah, um, it's just a target, like kind of what you're hitting at. Mm -hmm. um, I tell people... Look, that's your target. So as you touch, you're aiming for that point as you come back up. Okay, cool. Um, we'll touch on programming considerations. I'm going to pop over to some videos first. Um, so the things we want to talk about, frequency, um, close grip, pause grip, pen bench, wide bench, all that stuff. Um, and I'm going to pull up uh, our boy MJDC here. MJDC. MJDC. We have no idea what it stands for still. <laughs> we'll actually do this one. There we go. Hey, no mask. Is the first hey, time mask is going off for MJDC. <laughs> so if I remember correctly, MJDC before, he had a very, very narrow grip. Very narrow grip. Um, so let's see if he has changed that guy up. Ooh. It's quite the arch. I'm Amazing. digging it, man. Okay. Yeah, MJ, these are way better than before. Yep. And now his setup may look silly and it may have seemed kind of drawn out, but I, I like that. I like how he spent time actually, you know, preparing himself, getting everything locked into position, and then unracking it instead of just, you know, just go bro ham and slide underneath the thing and taking it out of the rack. All right, we got MJ in the comments. He said, I think this is an old video. We already did this one. MJ, the last bench video we did, there was a pretty jacked guy with big pecs in the background who was spotting you. That's the last one I think that we did. And then that one was like a very close grip bench press. Yeah, no, we haven't done this one. Paul got that set up for Paul I mean, Carter. Maybe an old video. It's just that we, there is a fair few in the queue. We, so. Yeah, yeah. We've had a good bit stacked up. But yeah, I like the one you pull yourself into the bar. This is a good setup. But um, yeah, keep the grip wide, man, and things should things should go well. Um, we'll find another video. We have uh, not a drug lord. We'll see how this one goes. Is this, this is Taho, isn't it? It could be. It may well be. Interesting touch point on this one. Chase, what are your thoughts on this guy? Um, I think he's not letting his elbows bend as much as he needs to and getting them into the proper position. Um, so I'm not a drug lord. I would like to see like your elbows point towards your feet a little bit more. Kind of lift up your spine off the bench and meet the bar instead of letting the bar just kind of crash down on you. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think of it as like, your chest raising up does half the work and the bench or the bar rather is lowering that does the other half. So you're kind of like meeting those two together and you're going to stay more solid that way. 
Yeah, they need to meet each other. I think you're trying to keep the elbows too open, and you're ro you're rotating your arm down, but you're yeah. not letting your elbows close. So like what Chase was saying with pulling your elbows down, take your elbow, have it pull down or point down to your waist, but then let your knuckles fall back to your shoulders. Like let your elbow close, and you'll have a little bit of a better time getting it to touch your chest. Um, keep doing weightlifting. Lift weights. <laughs> we got we to gotta get rid of this shape, my man. My noble Tejo Affleck. Um, uh, Erdwin, Erdin Vito, oh, Erdvin, Edvin, man, reading is super hard. Um, what could be the reason that one side of the bar goes up more than the other? Um, it could be limb length. So literally people have different length arms and they can be pushing up at a, at a simultaneous or a synchronous rate, uh, but it will go up faster on one side. Um, and it could be shoulder packing. So like what Mick was talking about earlier, his left shoulder could come unpacked. His right shoulder could, you know, still be packed behind him and it's going to cause it to be a little bit tilted. Um, Chase, do you worry often whenever uh, a bar is tilted? Well, it depends. Like if it's a kid, like I've had some people actually a, a dude um, that I used to coach down in Houston who he would have a, such a severity of kind of a little bit of a shift and like his arms were okay. Uh, he could hold a nice arch, but it just, I don't know. I, I never really could figure it out. It wasn't like a dominancy thing or anything like that, but we had to clamp this bench and usually I never make, people clamp their benches. You know, I tell them not to, but on this one instance, yeah, we actually had to have him clamp a bench. Interesting. Okay, cool. We got, um, we got Thomas Stavel here. Thomas Stavel. Stavel. So real quick, relative strength. Um, I see that you've been doing starting strength method just for over a year now. Um, if you want to send in videos and stuff, you need to go. Yeah. So, Theodore just put it in the in the chat. Uh, so it's, that's the wrong email address. It's uh, it's support at strength dot club. Anyway, sorry. Theodore, got get demon. wrecked. Come on, son. Um, how do we feel about this bench press? I like to see his feet a little bit more in. Like he's he has somewhat of an arch, but I want to see a little bit more. I think he can get a little bit more of an arch. Yeah. Um, and just more weight, man. This is a little bit too light. Yeah, more weight. I think that he is artificially slowing down the descent. It seems like you're pacing yourself on the way down. You can speed that up a little bit as you get more confident with it. Um, add some weight. Add Be pretty aggressive about it, Thomas, um, and then start to pick that dispense, descent speed up a little bit. Um, and then pull your feet back, just like uh, Chase was saying, and it'll probably help you out with the uh, the grip strength. It seems like he's doing some uh, strongman stuff or some grip training stuff. He has a little oh, implement nice. over here. You see that thing? What's that thing called? Where it's like you have various attachments, like one's a cone – One's like a like a. I don't know what it's called, but people use that for like the strongman stairs. That's always a. Oh yeah, a popular one. Um, but okay, yeah, we'll get back to uh, programming considerations here. Well, is it? Do you want to um just? I, I put a new video for MJDC in there as well. Do you want to take a quick look at that? He said he's um, sure. shoulder up. Let me pull it up. We're gonna watch me go through this next fold, everybody. Is it MJDC bench or MJDC? Uh, I think it's MJDC. Okay, live hot takes, everybody. Never before seen new MJDC footage. All right, first of all, fuck the guy in the white for loading the ball like that. Because if it's not two tens, don't be the ass hat who fucking uses like five sets of five just to load 45 pounds onto the bar. Don't be that dude. Don't be that guy. I hope that's what he was actually telling him as he was setting up. He could have also been saying, don't touch the bar. <laughs> hey, do not touch it. All right. We got a single. Hard double. And a very hard triple. Oh, he's going again. All right. <laughs> uh yeah, he was saying don't touch the bar. Okay. All right, cool, MJ. Um, yeah, man, I would not have went for the fourth rep with that bar speed. You should be able to tell when a rep is going to move. That rep was clearly not going to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was saying don't touch the bench. Um, I think your grip is starting to uh, start to narrow up again. Um, if your problem is that your bench chronically gets too narrow, make sure that it goes wider and you're training your bench chronically wide. Um, 
And then if you're noticing that you're having frequent shoulder pain with your bench, you may have to do more benching at a lighter weight than you want to rather than pushing at this intensity. Um, Chase, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, you, I, I just drop it down a little bit, work on trying to keep your elbows in the proper position because you're kind of killing the drive up by getting the bar path too soon over the shoulder, right? So where now you're, you're really firing out the, the elbows and you're, you're killing that drive off the chest. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the setup and stuff, I like it. Everything looks pretty good. Yeah, this is a programming thing, I would say, almost for sure, MJ. Um, Greg Locke, uh, thoughts on spotting the bench? Stay the hell out of people's way, I would say, mm -hmm. for spotting the bench. Um, catastrophic failures in the bench press are really, really rare. Um, if they do happen, um, it's going to be like a pec tear at a super high weight. You should be aware of those things going into it. No one really ever drops the bar over their face. That's pretty rare as well. Um, you don't have to be... Uh, you don't have to be super cautious with it. Um, and most people, even if they do fail a bench, it can stay on their chest for a second or two. The thing that you really have to worry about is panicking and then doing something stupid. Um, there's always videos of like people falling over the person they're spotting and crazy things like that. Um, MJ said, I think the bar speed was slow because my shoulder was killing me. Um, probably not. It's probably a little bit more the other way. Think about the fatigue that you were accumulating for the week. So if that was like your third pressing session, third foot benching or pressing session, it's fatigue in relationship to pain in relationship to speed. They're all connected. You can't really ever divorce those. Mm -hmm. um, any parting thoughts for MJ here, guys? Are you guys noticing like a weird sort of jerking motion at the very top as he as he starts the descent down? Um, yeah, a lot of people really like unlock their elbows in like a popping motion very quickly. Is that what you're talking about, Mick? Yeah, just I mean, if you look, if you look now, Riders right, right is about to uh, drop the bar or to set the bar descends down. It just seems to be a, like a little upward motion just before the bar descends. Mm -hmm. Like right now, yeah. Yeah, that little pop with his hands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of a tick that people do. You know, whenever I'm squatting, for example, I'll like reset my head position every time I'll do it. I'll like pick my head up and tuck my chin down. I don't need to, but I do. You know, it's. <laughs> It's one of those things. Yep. I'm sure you have some weird stuff. Chase, do you have any weird things you do when you lift? Dude, I'm weird. Like, I, I have to hike up my shorts. Like, even if I'm wearing, like, the small Oh, you get the squat shorts. diaper. Yeah, like, I, 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 you know, the guys who used to train me in Wichita Falls whenever I was growing up, but, like, they did it. I'm like, oh, I guess I have to do this to get really fucking strong. Um, but, like, you know, I always wear short shorts to begin with, and then I just hike them up even more. I I just, I don't know, I like the feeling. I like having that mindset and that ease of like, okay, I have, nothing is going to, you know, catch my knee. Nothing is going to prevent me from hitting the, the death that I need to. Yeah. And you feel very pretty. It's a win-win for everybody. And, and there's a nice breeze down there too. It feels amazing. Can't lose boys. Um, all right. So we'll do, we'll do kind of a speed round here for programming. Um, Chase, you want to take the first point frequency? Yeah. Frequency matters. So I kind of touched on this on an article I, I wrote um, some you know, months back, if you want to be better at benching, you got to bench more. Um, and how we accomplish that through frequency is exercise selection, right? So like if you're benching normally twice a week, you know, you're doing like singles on one end and volume on the other, start incorporating some pin bench, close grip, uh, something of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Variation to add frequency, figure out what variations work for you. So be like, all right, on this next, you know, six to 12 week block, I'm gonna tr I'm gonna really run my close grip up, right? And I'm gonna see how that impacts my relative one RM, three RMs. Um, same thing with the pause bench. If you notice that you're someone who really like rockets the bar off their rib cage, right? So if you use a lot of elastic rebound, a pause bench will probably be good for you. Um, if you're someone who you notice is like, I just get really stuck at the top. I'm really afraid of heavy weights, things like that. Try a pin bench, you know. Um, and if you're someone like MJDC who keeps bringing their grip in a little bit too much, try a wide grip. Um, I really like to think about variation with the upper body movements as kind of like shoring up weaknesses in the bench press. There's a ton of room to play around with that. Yep. Um, where do you think the dip and like the lying tricep extension, maybe the dumbbell bench, where do you think those fit in here? Um, I would rather do generally, I think of it like this, right? So any, um, existence exercise. So like, you know, I classify as like the, the closed grip, the pause, the pin bench, all as existent assistant exercises the best assistant exercise is the one that's as closely uh recreatable as the bench itself right because now we're, we're adding too much variables we're adding maybe too uh specialized equipment with you know maybe doing like a dumbbell bench or you know like um 
a standing tricep extension, uh, French press or something like that. Whereas, you know, I, I can overload the pin bench. I can load the pause bench and I can, you know, kind of play around with how long I'm pausing it. Um, with an LTE, you know, I rather pick those over dips because um, the majority of people um, can't really handle dips, right? Now they can to a certain extent with them being lighter and stuff, but actually progressing those being weighted dips, um, you put yourself into a, a kind of a hazardous situation with tweaking the shoulders and there's a lot more longevity in the LTE. Yeah, the LTE can has a, has a ton of room to run for sure. Yeah. Um, I think I I like to get ahead. I think I disagree with you there a little bit, Chase, on how to prioritize them. Because um, if you if I'm already doing three movements that look very yeah. much so like a bench press a week, adding a fourth, the d- diminishing return is going to be pretty high. You know, so I found if I'm doing like two normal bench sessions a week and then one like pause bench or a close grip, adding yeah. in a fourth session of more benching probably isn't going to do the trick. At that point, I always like to touch on something like a dip or an LTE or a dumbbell bench just to kind of spice it up a little bit more. Um, the dip, um, they're like Chase was saying, they're surprisingly more traumatic than people think. It's not to say that they're inaccessible, right? But they take a lot of time. And if you're working in with more general population people, they're really out of reach for most for most guys, you know, for most women as well. Um, if you're working with just like young athletic people, you can probably hammer them with dips until the, the cows come home. No one cares. Um, but for most normal people, they'll be they're surprisingly stressful. Um, Tejo said, "Are push-ups uh, any good as an accessory to benching?" Um, if you can do them heavy and you have someone to help you load them. Yeah. Cause like a 45 pound push up isn't even that heavy, but if you can do some 90 pound push ups, they're helpful, you know? Um, yeah, it, it really depends. They're a great ab exercise. <laughs> Tell you what, um, have like 150 pounds on your back when you're doing your push ups. Um, but okay. So the relationship to press, this was touching on Chase's article too. Um, hopefully we'll put a link to that in the description. Um, but what are you thinking about like what is kind of an acceptable thing because I think a lot of the novices especially they'll expect their press and their bench to be really similar how far away are those for you normally um, for me currently like my ratio is pretty close because I hardly ever train that bench mm-hmm. but at, uh, the closest uh, there's a 30 pound difference um, what now, do you see for most people in the gym I'm gonna say well actually so I had a guy today bench 170 for some singles and he is going to press 105 for five triples. So there's mm-hmm. kind of a big disparity. Um, usually, you know, as people get more up in there, uh, in their progression, maybe 100 pounds, 90 pounds, uh, somewhere in that ballpark is usually the ratio that I see. Yeah, there's a pretty big disparity. So I think a lot of novices will look at it and be like, oh, I'm benching 145, I'm pressing 100, what's wrong? You know, you need yeah. more muscle mass on your chest, more muscle mass on your delts. It'll, it'll take some time to mature out. Um, that's kind of the last point that I wanted to touch on here. Um, so everybody, thank you for watching. If you're still sticking around, hopefully this was helpful for you. Uh, make sure to subscribe, uh, to press some sort of button about the whole thing. Um, yeah. Email support at strength club with any shit posting related comments that you have. Ask Mick how his day was. Um, anything else, boys? That's it. Fuck That's the it. Bench. Do the bench. All right. Signing off. Go do some curls. Go do some bench. <laughs>